Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of What's on My Desk. What do we have today? Again, a bunch of watches that couldn't be different from one another, but as I said, comes across my desk, I'll talk about it. So what do I bring? I brought the Bumblebee. That was my best impression of the voice from the movie, sorry. Um, I brought the Ulysse Nardine Circus Minute Repeater, as well as the RM60, but not just any RM60, but the limited edition regatta. Hmm, where should I start? I'm gonna kick things off with the Bumblebee, right? And why, why, why do I wanna talk about the Bumblebee? It's yet another older offshore that you guys I'm sure are all familiar with. Let's take a closer look. You're too close, man. It is pretty obvious why this watch was dubbed the Bumblebee. What's the story with this and what makes it any, what makes this watch any more special than a, any other regular older offshore, uh, let's say such as the Volcano, the Safari, the Navy, and all the other slew of limited edition uh, uh, offshores that were made in the last 10 years. Uh, well, it was around the time where carbon was becoming popular and uh, Audemars Piguet did a great job in coming out with quite a few carbon made watches. Let me show you the side of the case, which is indeed made all out of carbon. If you guys remember, um, I, I did an episode on the carbon team Alinghi, the all carbon watch to include the bezel. I spoke about that watch and one of the problems with that watch was that the bezel would get messed up because it's such a soft material, technically it's plastic, I guess. Uh, so this particular watch, they actually replaced it with a ceramic bezel, making it a lot more durable and therefore fixing that particular issue. Strap to match with the yellow stitching, black PVD buckle made out of titanium, which is extremely durable as well. And overall, just a good looking offshore. Let me put this thing on my wrist. It's a thing of beauty. I like all black watches. I told you the Alinghi was probably one of my favorite limited edition offshores due to the fact that it's so light. This watch is not as light as the Alinghi because it's not all carbon. You got the ceramic bezel, you got a stainless steel case back, but the case is still carbon, so therefore this watch is still fairly light in comparison to all steel models. Original retail price on this watch was 35,400 when it first came out. They, and this was expensive in comparison to the other offshores, like the Volcano, the Safari, for example. Today's offshores retail in that 26, for 26.6. At the time this came out, uh, I think the offshores were retailing in the low twos. I think it was 21.2 or 22.1, something like that. So with this being at 35,000, this was an expensive offshore in comparison to the others. But nevertheless, when it came out, it didn't discount as much because they didn't make very many of these in comparison to the models I previously just mentioned. So there was a hype about these watches. And how about that? There's still a hype about these watches. Many years later, this watch is still trading in that $20,000 price range on a secondary market use, which is pretty darn good if you consider how long it's been and how many other new options are out there when it comes to offshores, all the new 44 millimeters, all the various variations with the ceramic bezels and other carbon cases and titanium, et cetera, et cetera. This isn't much older watch, but yet somewhat still keeps its value. And I think the reason it keeps its value so well in comparison to some of the other mo older models out there is because again, it's just a good looking watch. It's a, it's something completely different. It's reminiscent of the old end of days that came out in 2001, I think it was. And guys that like APs will still reach for this watch, will still look for this watch. And the reason they do it is once again, just a good looking watch. Absolutely love this particular offshore. Moving on to something fun, and that is the Ulysses Nardine Circus Minute Repeater. Again, night and day when it comes to pricing versus, let's say, the Bumblebee, for, versus the Bumblebee, for example. But this is something I just really wanted to show you guys. Now, Circus Minute Repeater, uh, something that came out right after the Genghis Khan Minute Repeaters, which was a huge craze, specifically in the Russian market. And when the Genghis Khan was first introduced, Everybody went eight over the fact that uh, you had a scene, a depicted scene of Genghis Khan fighting in a battle, right? And all the little figurines on the screen would move and so on and so forth. So, and that watch was expensive. It was, it was north of 600,000 Swiss francs, depending on the combinations. And the ones with the baguette settings, I think were over 800,000 Swiss francs or even more, I don't remember exactly. So they kind of come down to earth a little bit, utilize the same technology, the same movement, and simply just put a minute repeater in place and bring in the price down to earth. Well, relatively speaking, this thing retails for 425,000 Swiss francs, but in comparison to the Genghis Khan, it was much cheaper. So let's talk about the craze. So obviously you see a, a depicted scene of a circus here, and I'm gonna move the hands around just so we get more chimes out of this. Hold on. The depicted scene that starts to come alive as the minute repeater is set off, let's do it.
Doesn't seem like a big deal, but it is a big deal. This is a mechanical feat in the wristwatch that doesn't carry a battery. And as far as I'm concerned, this is a timeless watch. I think 50 to 100 years from now, people will be talking about the minute repeaters that have moving scenes on a dial. Now this, this you've seen this in our strikers from Elise and Nardine, where the one guy just ringing the bell. I think I've shown one of those before. Uh, you've seen this depicted in erotica watches when you flip the watch back over and there's a sex scene in the back of the watch again with the figurines moving. Uh, something very, very, very unmistakably Ulysses Nardine. Overall design of the watch, the stone dial is absolutely, you can see it sparkle as I turn the watch. It's absolutely gorgeous. The white gold figurines uh, that are hand carved on the dial are absolutely gorgeous. Manual wind movement, not surprising, because uh, this watch is complex to make this an automatic would probably be even a bigger feat. Traditional Ulysses Nardine. If I if I put this watch on the side, you would know this is a mini repeater. But if you look at this watch from the side, you can get as many watches like the Sonata or the GMT Perpetual, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, because again, indeed, while well, without showing you the mini repeater lever, indeed, just looking at it from the side, you can tell that this is a Ulysses Nardine. For those that know Ulysses Nardine, it's a fairly heavy watch because the movement is heavy. The fact that it's white gold obviously makes it heavy. It's not as comfortable on the wrist to me simply because of the way the lugs and the straps are. It wears a lot bigger. I sort of wish that this strap would have a little more flex in it. I have a small wrist, so there's the downfall. But nevertheless, beautiful watch on the wrist, just the same. Bravo, Ulysses and Nardine for making this, but let's talk about resale value. I've talked up in the past how Ulysses and Nardine kind of tanked, especially since the Russian market started having problems. And 425,000 Swiss francs, what is the fate of this watch? When I, I, I will tell you that when this watch first came out, along with the Genghis Khan, these thing, this things would not discount more than like 10%. It was crazy because dealer cost at the time was, I think dealers got 15% uh, off and on top of that, another 10% off once the watch sold to a client. Extremely limited production. They made only 30 of these in different metals and they made them in platinum and rose gold as well. And there were a couple of other limited variations with uh, precious stones. So since originally there was not a huge discount on them, even on the secondary market at the time these things came out, uh, the resale value was great. You know, you'd be hard pressed to find this watch even used for more than 25, 30% off at the time. Fast forward to today, I think we're selling this watch retail 165,000 used. That's a hell of a drop considering these watches were trading at uh, 300 dollars to $350,000. But does that make it a, a bad watch? No, I've talked about our other influences on uh, market prices on certain particular watches and this suffered the same fate. It just means that you can get out there today and get yourself a, a smoking deal on uh, some of the most complicated pieces out in the world period. So I saved the big dog for last. Ian, don't do it. Don't do it, Ian. Don't do it. Yeah, he did it, didn't he? Anyway, so the big dog is the RM60. And the reason I call it the big dog is because this thing is huge. Uh, here, let's, let's put this up to the bumblebee I just talked about earlier, right? Look at the size difference between these two. It's absolutely ridiculous. It makes the bumblebee look like a baby. And bumblebee is a big watch, right? Wow. Oh, I'll give you one better. Let me put it next to my Royal Oak. You guys think I can swing this watch? Yeah, probably not. As much as I would love to wear this timepiece, that's just way too big for me. RM60, not just an RM60, it's the RM60 St. Bart Limited Edition, right? Uh, so let's talk about Richard Mille for a second and the regatta at St. Bart. So the regatta at St. Bart started in 2010 and Richard Mille has been involved since day one. You can see images and videos of the Richard Mille regatta boat during the St. Bart's race. St. Bart's as an island itself, for those that have been can certainly relate that this is heaven on earth. It's indeed my favorite island in the Caribbean as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I actually think I made a video. I'll link it up there um, for you guys to check it out if you haven't seen it. The St. Bart's regatta is since 2010 has picked up pace and became one of the most famous uh, regattas in the Caribbean period. And simply because of the setting, I mean, St. Bart's is just gorgeous. It's a great place to be in terms of hotels, food, entertainment, clubs, etc. It's just a fun, fun place to be. So people flock to that regatta. Or maybe someone just uses an excuse to go there once again. Let's talk about the RM60 specifically. According to Richard Meal, this was the watch to navigate the seven seas with. Why is this the watch to navigate the seven seas with? Front of the watch. Let's talk about functionality real quick, right? So you have your chronograph, your flyback chronograph. You have the large date display that's extremely visible as well as the month displays. And you uh, down here is, as you see in the other, the Richard Meals. This watch looks like a compass, right? 
Here's a, here's a west, east, north, and south, right? Well, it features a UTC hand here, and it can be used either as a second time zone indicator or in combination with the sun and the rotating bezel to orient the points of the compass. And this can be easily adjusted by pressing the I can't even grasp this watch, it's so big. Um, it can be easily uh, moved by the button here on the side. I'll just show you that real quick. Notice how I try to like, it's just, it's difficult. This thing is humongous. This is humongous. And of course, in the back of the crystal, there's your regatta symbol identifying that this is made for the St. Bart's regatta. And I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna attempt to pronounce how that sounds in French because I'm just gonna mangle that and whoever understands French will probably just laugh at me. <laughs> Limited edition of 150 pieces, and everything about this watch screams summer, fun in the sun, St. Bart's, just all the color, the white strap, obviously, the light blues, the oranges, and everything about this watch, and St. Bart's, at least to me, I mean, of course, it can be any other Caribbean island, but everything about this watch is just very tropical, if you ask me. If you compare it to the regular RM60, which is predominantly green colors and a black strap, obviously, this, and you put the two side by side, well, I don't have the other one, you can definitely see, um, how this is, just screams summer to me. Maybe not necessarily regatta, but certainly screams the tropics to me. Uh, retail price on this watch, $160,000. What does this watch trade for today? Brand new at 125,000. Wait a minute, you say, it's a discounted Richard Meal. What's going on? Well, you have to ask yourself a question. Everybody that wants a Richard Meal, they want a Tenno shape Richard Meal, you know, and those are the best selling ones. And that's because that's what Richard Meal started with. And by the way, I um, forgot to mention, uh, when it came to regatta watches, uh, this isn't like their first marine theme watch. I think it was the Perini Cup watches uh, that started it all, the RM14 and the RM15. This is sort of like the follow-up to the other two. So resale value, right? Um, again, this is not a norm. Uh, this is not your normal to know shaped uh, Richard Meals. And I've told you guys before, the round Richard Meals suffer the fate of, A, when you go out of the norm, people, people don't want to wear Richard Meal, they want it to look like a Richard Meal. This doesn't look like a Richard Meal, even though it does, if you ask me. Not a whole lot of people can wear this behemoth. In fact, I would love to wear this watch. I'm actually going to put it on, on so you guys can see what it looks like on my small wrist. Look at this thing. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like it could use two of my wrists. And if I put it here, kind of give you an idea just how huge this watch is. Uh, could I wear it? Yes, I could. Uh, is it gonna, does it look stupid on me? Absolutely, it does, I have to say that. So bottom line is, is that again, it's out of the norm of the regular Richard Mille case sizes, which is to, which case shapes, which is the Tenel shape cases, and it's extremely, extremely big, therefore you can pick this watch up at a discount. So if you got a huge wrist and you don't wanna pay double retail for a particular Richard Mille, this, this might be a watch for you. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode of What's on My Desk. Again, something very differently. As you already know what I have on my wrist, so we don't have to go any further. I've been, I've been sticking with my A-Series Royal Oak. I do have something in the works, another vintage watch that I mentioned in one of my previous episodes uh, that I'm trying to make a deal on, so maybe I'll switch this one up or maybe go a little more modern. Maybe I'll wear the Bumblebee. But nevertheless, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe if you're not already a subscriber, if you enjoy this content, and I'll see you guys next week for more watch reviews and other videos.